Thomas Paine, born in England in 1737, he met Benjamin Franklin, then a representative for the colonies at the English Parliament, at the age of 37. And with a letter of introduction, Thomas Paine then made his way to America. There, a year later, he penned one of the most important tracts ever written, Common Sense, which was published in January of 1776, just five and a half months before the Declaration of Independence. Common Sense advocated separation from England. It argued that any possible reconciliation between America and England was now impossible. And the Declaration itself, six months later, one could say, ratified the, uh, the vision of common sense. Thomas Paine was one of the most restless men of his time. He served in the American military after uh, the Declaration of Independence, during which he wrote 16 papers in the heat of battle called the American Crisis. And these served as inspirations for men, inspiration for men in the field through the American Revolutionary War over the next seven or eight years. But Paine moved on. He went back to England, and later he went to France. And it was in a French prison that he wrote the iconoclastic Age of Reason. His rebellion in this final work was so powerful, so much against the inherited Christian tradition, that Thomas Paine died in poverty and neglect in New York. Welcome to English 3350 a survey of American literature before the Civil War. We're in Studio 3 at the MD Anderson Library on the main campus of the University of Houston. I'm Barry Wood, and today we're continuing our look at 18th century Enlightenment literature, a little more on Thomas Paine and also Thomas Jefferson. We started with the most radical of Thomas Paine's writings, uh, The Age of Reason, and and that's 20 years after the work that made him famous. We've done that for a purpose because with, uh, with religion being so absolutely central to 17th century literature and the Enlightenment then uh, upsetting so many 17th century values with the rise of science, we do need to, uh, to deal with, with what religion became in the 18th century. Now, if you've read Thomas Paine's Age of Reason carefully, you, you know that he is not anti-religion. He is opposed to a particular kind of religion, which demeaned the deity, any deity that there might be, in his opinion. His, uh, his attacks really are three or four in number. In terms of, let us say, the Catholic tradition, he had very strong words to say against the institutional church, the pope, saints, miracles, the elaborate lore of Satan and evil, and purgatory. And he uh, labeled these fabulous, which is a, a, a word that's easily misunderstood. I mean, he's really saying that these are related to fables. In terms of the, the Protestant tradition, which does not rely for authority on the institutional church, but instead turns to the Bible as its final authority, Thomas Paine was uh, very uh, vocal there, too. He uh, attacked a reliance on the Bible as the Word of God. He felt simply the Bible could not stand up to this. And uh, he has long sections in the Age of Reason in which he, he goes through the numerous uh, contradictions and so on in the Bible and, and problems. And, uh, and, of course, these are not all new with, with pain, but he had a, an ability to popularize ideas and to set forth um, things in very polemical fashion and appeal to the, the common man. So this work had a very powerful effect on uh, Americans. And it was published in 1794, and Paine, of course, was already famous 
from 20 years early, 18 years earlier with common sense. So a great number of people read The Age of Reason because it was written by Paine and it, it, it got a lot of exposure. A, a third thing that he attacked very strongly was the whole notion of uh, revelation. He makes a, a good, a great point, for instance, of saying if uh, there is a revelation to Moses, that's a revelation to one person, but if that revel revelation is then communicated to someone else, let us say Pharaoh, it's not a revelation to Pharaoh. And in the same way, if we read about it in the Bible, it's not a revelation to us. It is only a revelation to the individual person. And he, he talks in many ways, I mean, he could talk about Jesus, he could talk about Paul, the road to uh, Damascus experience. I suppose he, he could talk about many of the revelatory experiences down through history. And the same argument would hold their revelations to one person, but for everyone else, they're secondhand, they're derivative, they're hearsay. And uh, this was the primary fault with the notion of biblical revelation. Uh, Paine was interested in something that would be universal, not something time-bound. And of course, the, the other thing that was wrong with revelation for Thomas Paine was the fact that it was confined to a culture, a single culture, that it was locked into a language, and granted that language could be translated, but the, the idea that uh, an infinite deity would so choose to um, entrust his, you know, his ultimate truth to a small culture in a forgotten part of the world, and then have that depended upon the whole process of translation and transmission and so on, he felt that that just did not make logical sense. And I think the fourth thing that he attacks is this notion of a reliance on faith. The fact that uh, much of what he sees in traditional Christianity, the church, the Bible, and, and so on, uh, just doesn't make it, it complete sense reasonably. One has to overleap uh, reason and, and resort to faith in order to accept a great deal of it. These, of course, are standard criticisms of, of Christianity voiced in the 18th century. He was not the only one. There's a long list of, of books uh, written all the way back in England to the very late 17th century that said some of these things. Uh, but they were first made public in this dramatic sort of way by, uh, by Thomas Paine. What he was for was a religion based on reason, and uh, his criticisms should be seen as his attempt at putting Christianity on a sounder basis than the church, Bible, revelation, or faith those four things that he criticizes. It, it needs to be emphasized that the Enlightenment thinkers did believe in God. They perceived reason as exploring into God's work. If we, uh, we look at Franklin and, and Paine, we see obvious statements of faith in their works. There's, there's no atheism here, no agnosticism, very firm statements of, of faith but they were moving very strongly towards an intellectual religion. Now, let's look at a little bit of vocabulary here. Our words, uh, theism, theology, polytheism, which means uh, many gods, monotheism, which means the religion of one god. All of these come from a Greek root meaning, uh, theos meaning God. And um, that particular word, or root, tends to have the notion of a personal, uh, either personal god, an anthropomorphic god, the kind of gods that you find in the Old Testament or in Greek mythology, or indeed in most mythologies. Very anthropomorphic in, in uh, presence. Uh, and theism the, is the belief in a, a personal god. And uh, when, when, you, when you refer to someone as a theist, you're, you're, you're really saying that they have a belief in a, a personal God. Now, 
if you talk literally in terms of the roots of these words, then deism comes from the Latin word for God. And so in, in one sense, theism and deism are exactly parallel. They both draw on a root that means God. But the, the theos has so many overtones of a personal God. The, uh, the deus uh, root that was picked up from Latin has, has a, a much more abstract connotation. Uh, in the way it's adopted into English. And um, this is why it was adopted for deism, because the, uh, the, the, the god that you find in deism is not so anthropomorphic, not so personal, not so much made in the image of man as, let's say, the Old Testament god is, uh, but much more as a kind of abstract principle you, know, you might remember that uh, that Franklin addressed his his prayer to to goodness in general. Uh, deism, then, um, a definition: the idea that God exists separately from the universe he created and set into motion as a machine. And here it's worth noting that. The definitions of, of deities are very time-bound. I mean, we've, we've talked about this before. People tend to think their definition of a, of a deity is, is something eternal and forever, and it's been there from the beginning. The 18th century was the age of science, and they saw the universe now for the first time as a machine. Uh, not as something hung out of heaven, uh, like the great chain of being of, of Renaissance times, but now they saw it as a finely working machine. And that's a metaphor. And the result of that is that they now conceived of, uh, of God as a great mechanic. Uh, having set the machine in motion, this God has no further personal interest in it. Um, one, I suppose, could, could say that if you're going to talk about machines, why not talk about, oh, the Ford Motor Company. Um, Ford Motors up in Dearborn makes cars. Once they roll off the assembly line and they ship them out, they really have no more interest in them. And in fact, uh, the car ought to run without ever going back to Ford Motors in Dearborn. Uh, this is like the great mechanic god who makes the world at the beginning and, and then it runs like a machine separate. I mean, you know, the car you drive to school is not constantly, mysteriously, you know, maintained by Dearborn Motors. There's no, I mean, there may be a force in Star Wars, but there's no force uh, that's maintaining your vehicle. It, it's separate. There's no constant maintenance here. And, uh, and, and this, um, of course, is very different from the previous notion of God as constantly involved, constantly in touch with, with events. Uh, in the 17th century, ready to break in at any time, and capable of breaking in and, and breaking his own laws through the, the mechanism of, of uh, miracle. <clears throat> Joseph Priestley is, is the one responsible for the classic uh, metaphor of deism. Uh, he said, if you were walking along a deserted beach and you um, found a, a watch on the beach and picked it up, um, you'd be looking at a very fine machine, working machine, and that the existence of that machine would necessarily imply a watchmaker. It's impossible to have a watch without a watchmaker. And on that analogy, um, the, the argument uh, of deism, it's really an argument from design. Uh, is that the design of the universe implies a designer. Uh, now, we don't want to get into all the philosophical debates on this. The, 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 that argument has got all kinds of philosophical problems, and that's not our job to go into. I mean, it's an imperfect metaphor. Uh, the, uh, the watch is a man-made object, so the, the answer that there's a watchmaker is already built into the metaphor whereas it's not necessarily built into the, the idea of the universe as a design. And to use the word design on the universe, is, after all, is a projection. Or it's our own projection on it. Um, so 
It's an imperfect metaphor, but in any case, this is the one that, that became very popular in the, in the age of, of deism. And the metaphor implies, you see, this idea of like Ford Motors. It, it's separate. Once the machine is made, the machine then goes on. The, the watch will theoretically go merrily ticking on its way for all eternity without the watchmaker. Now, where does man come in? Well, you know, your car may break down. You take it to a garage. A good mechanic doesn't have to phone Dearborn. He, you know, he can fix it. And even if he doesn't have a manual, a good mechanic can, can tinker with your car and get it working again. Uh, similarly, you take your watch to a repair shop and, and get it fixed up. But you never have to go back to the, let's say, a Swiss-made watch or a Hong Kong-made watch. You never have to go back to the watchmaker. You just go and, and get it repaired. And thus, this definition of deism, uh, uh, having set the machine in motion, this god has no further personal interest in it. And this was the position that the deists took, that yes, God may have made the world, but we could uh, essentially ignore him because the world now operated on rational principles that he had built into it. Mechanical principles, I mean, the scientists, the scientific discoveries suggested these principles were rational and mechanic. And uh, this, you see, um, as, as we pointed out last day, the, the Puritan idea of man as a sinner and God as, as unknowable made the whole scientific enterprise within that framework impossible. But with this idea of God as a distant mechanic who made the machine on rational principles, and, and man is uh, potentially good and perfect, you could see that this definition of God makes the scientific enterprise quite possible. Scientific laws are discoverable by reason. Uh, the existence of scientific laws imply a rational order in the universe. Uh, and the fact that you could ferret out, let's say, the laws of motion or, or uh, chemical combinations or the orbits of the planets and calculate these by systems of mathematics and so on, uh, to, to these uh, thinkers, this was proof that there was a rational God. Um, you'll notice again that the God is just being made again in the image of man in the 18th century. 1000 BC, he was being made in the image of a warrior god because people were warriors. And later on, he's made in the image of kingly, a king because, you know, kings rule the world. Now it's rational uh, scientists that rule the world, so they make God in that image. And that's, that's always the case with, with deities. Um, the, uh, these, uh, these uh, of course, arguments for, for God or uh, views of what he is are always analogical. Uh, now, analogies like the watchmaker and the watch are amazingly persuasive. They are, they're metaphorical. They, they have a literary quality to them. Analogy and metaphor uh, are the same things that you find in poetry and literature. And uh, they're based on an imaginative apprehension of, of things rather than a referential use of words. And uh, um, in fact, no argument you see for God or no description of God can, can really escape the limits of the language used to frame the definition. One of those interesting things that it may be why uh, theology has become sort of a lost discipline in the last quarter century or so. Um, let's look at then the whole picture of, of deism uh, sort of working towards a, a kind of overall definition here. Deism uh, claimed natural law was evidence of rational design in nature. Deism argued from the design to the designer. It argued from the watch to the watchmaker. And as I said, that was Joseph Priestley's um, version, the watch to the watchmaker. Deism accepted the authority of reason. It uh, certainly rejected miracles and uh, all other signs of supernaturalism. It denied the Trinity. 
the Trinity was seen particularly as, as a Catholic uh, corruption and, and uh, you know, and this is seen as moving back towards polytheism. And of course that's, that's the way uh, Protestants have tended to see Mary, the, you know, the assumption of Mary and the saints too as tending back towards polytheism. Uh, it, uh, deism also denied the absolute authority of the Bible on a kind of simple uh, rational inspection of the Bible, looking, looking at it um, if you, you know, clear away the idea that it is somehow a revolution, a literal uh, revelation of God's words, and look at it through the eyes of reason, of course, you come to quite different assumptions from what people did formerly. Also denied the divinity of Christ uh, on, the, on the grounds that the divinity of Christ is really something that uh, occurs about three or four centuries after Christ's time in, in the formulation of doctrines. The Council of Chalcedon is probably the reference point in the uh, fifth century for uh, the divinity of Christ. And, and the uh, 18th century uh, deists uh, uh, denied that divinity of Christ. And they, however, they did advocate divine worship. Now, it's, it, it must be noted that deism, um, this set of, of beliefs, was not a widespread religious movement. The masses at this time in the 18th century were really involved in ordinary congregational religion or revivals. Um, I pointed out Stoddard and the revivalist movements, his harvests started in the late 17th century. The, uh, Stoddard was uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards' grandfather. Jonathan Edward took out over Stoddard's position in Northampton, and uh, under Jonathan Edwards, um, the Great Awakening occurred in the 1740s, and uh, there was a huge revivalist uh, movement occurring there with traveling preachers going all over the country and so on. We're, we haven't, I haven't assigned uh, Jonathan Edwards on the course, but of, of course the most famous sermon ever preached is, is Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If you want to scare yourself, you've got two choices in this course. You, you read Edgar Allan Poe's stories or you read Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. E either one will perhaps disturb your sleep. Um, and revivals through the 19th century al are almost a constant uh, phenomenon. This is popular religion, and it, it continues to this day. Uh, the deist movement is specifically an in, in intellectual's approach. The highly educated, articulate thinkers, the writers, the philosophers, people aware of scientific developments. The masses were not aware of the scientific developments that were occurring. Um, the, uh, these were people that could, could stand back objectively and, and see that the church did have mythology connected with its history, that the Bible did have contradictions, that uh, Revelation ha was tied to uh, only one small nation, and it takes a fair bit of objectivity even now, two centuries later, for people to stand back in this rationalist way that the deists did and um, look at these things with a kind of cold clinical eye. And uh, so the, the vast majority of, of people don't and uh, they didn't in the 18th century. So in, in recognizing deism, we're, we're, we're talking about something that probably affected only a very minute percentage of thinkers and intellectuals in the 18th century. Those who were, were getting the best education and, and uh, were debating things philosophical and, and thinking these things through, seeing the implications of, of science for religion. Um, now, to, to look at um, Thomas Paine and his major publications, um, 
here are his years, uh, 1737 to 1809, and these are his major publications. Um, Thomas Paine was the son of a stay maker, which is a fancy word for a corset maker. The stays, of course, are the, the ribs that go in corsets to give them shape and, and body. Uh, he was a rebel all his life. He, he bucked against uh, working in his father's stay-making shop and, and ran away from home as an adolescent and served on a pirate ship for a, a short time. Came back, uh, got into business for a time. He became an excise man. This is in England, uh, collecting taxes and watching out for smuggled goods uh, on, on the docks and ports and so on. And in 1772, uh, at age 35, this is in England still, he wrote his first pamphlet, uh, The Case of the Officers of the Excise. Um, and this was, this was again, critical of, of policy, uh, and particularly the oppression of workers. If we wanted a modern name for what he was advocating and what he was doing, we'd probably say he's involved in union activity in 1772. He met up with Ben Franklin. At that point, uh, Franklin had no inclination of, or clue of, of how important a man Thomas Paine would be. He had just written, and I would suspect that, that Franklin um, read his work or, or may have been involved in the printing of it. In any case, he wrote a letter, which, which is ex extant. It's, it's, just a, you know, it's just a very ordinary sort of recommendation letter that that says this is a young man's going to come out to um, uh, America and, and he, he should be good at whatever he takes up and uh, I advocate giving him a job. And uh, with that very modest recommendation, uh, he made his way then to Philadelphia and in, the, uh, in 1774 at age 37 and in the, the two years before um, Common Sense, was published. Uh, Payne worked for the Pennsylvania Magazine, and here he discovered his ability to popularize liberal causes. He wrote short articles. There is uh, one in the one in the text which I didn't assign, but he criticized dueling. Uh, he criticized this, the uh, subordinate status of women, the rigid marriage and divorce laws, uh, slavery. The inhumane treatment of animals, these, some of these things are very modern in, in tone, but he was a polemicist and he, he, could, he, could, uh, he could pen something pretty fast. He, he advocated, here's, here's an interesting one, you know we still struggle with this in the world today, he advocated international copyright. I mean, today we're, you know, we're still getting American movies and videos ripped off around the world in far countries because really no way of, of dealing with copyright. He advocated the international arbitration between nations who are in dispute. Now that didn't come in until the United Nations was formed after World War II, you know, with the court in The Hague, the international court. So uh, he, um, he was certainly very much ahead of his time. In any case, he was caught up in the cause of uh, independence, and in October uh, of 1775, this is nine months before the Declaration of Independence, he, he wrote that independence for America was the cause of God and humanity. And about that time, he began to uh, right common sense. He poured it out in a, a flood of inspiration in just a few weeks. And I think we have to say that common sense is the most famous and most important pamphlet ever written in American history. It argued that the break between America and England was irreparable, that independence was a necessity, he did it with great eloquence, eloquence with compelling logic. Uh, look at this, this paragraph, for instance. Uh, this is almost prophetic. The sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. It is not the affair 
of a city, a county, a province, or a kingdom, but of a continent of at least one-eighth part of the habitable globe, it is not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Posterity are virtually involved in the contest and will be more or less affected even to the end of time by the proceedings now. He had no idea, of course, of, of how prophetic that would be. He, he wrote with lucidity, with force, with passion. He created a focus, always wrote with a purpose. Um, he showed how English acts were not for the good of the colonies, but were for the good, were for selfish English purposes. Here he writes, for instance, we have boasted the protection of Great Britain without considering that her motive was interest, not attachment, and that she did not protect us from our enemies on our account, but from her enemies on her own account, from those who had no quarrel with us or any other account, and who will always be our enemies on the same account. Let us throw off dependence and we should be at peace with France and Spain were they at war with England. Um, he had, has, has a way of, um, of summarizing, and he, he even attacks, you know, the sort of soft, mushy metaphors that people throw around. Here, for instance, he says, Britain is our parent country, say some. You need to be sensitive to the, the fact that parent, of course, is, is a very emotionally charged word. It's, it's a metaphor extended from the family out to the relationship between nations. Britain is the parent country, say some. It happens not to be true. Europe, and not England, is the parent country of America. This new world has been the asylum for the persecuted from every part of Europe. Not one-third of the inhabitants, even of this province of Pennsylvania, are of English descent. Wherefore, I reprobate the phrase of parent or mother country applied to England only as being false, selfish, narrow, and ungenerous. Uh, and then he, he, um, th he, he gets sometimes almost downright nasty um, to talk of friendship with those in whom our reason forbids us, us to have faith and our affections wounded through a thousand pores instruct us to detest his madness and folly. Ye that tell us of harmony and reconciliation, can ye restore to us the time that is past? Can ye give to prostitution its former innocence? Neither can ye reconcile Britain and America. The last cord is now broken. There are injuries which nature cannot forgive. Well, you see, very powerful, very powerful language. He just is able to, to he doesn't go into deep philosophical thoughts. Paine was not a profound philosophical thinker, but he was a, a master all of the, the basic ideas of the Enlightenment and learn to put them in the most uh, forceful rhetorical way. Uh, this work in three months sold 120,000 copies. It was reprinted in London, Edinburgh, Paris, Rotterdam. It truly really did become a worldwide pamphlet, worldwide in terms of the colonies and, and Europe. It was read aloud to illiterate people in circles in the colonies. Uh, people speculated that some great man was the author because it was published anonymously. People thought maybe Ben Franklin or John Adams or Sam Adams had, had written it. Uh, the pamphlet stirred up a great deal of emotion. It fired up rebellion. The idea of, of, uh, of independence was vaguely in the air, but uh, as people always are, there's a certain inertia involved. People can be very, very dissatisfied, and the dis dissatisfaction had been going on. If you know your American history, you know that, that there had been dissatisfaction for 15 years. I mean, the Stamp Act, the Quebec Act, and numerous uh, tariffs and, and so on that the, the British were putting on, and these, these went back for a number of years, and people would swallow one after another and never quite get galvanized to do anything about it. Uh, this work came along and uh, based on the contract theory of government in part one. Now, that's not in the anthology, but, 
uh, part one of common sense deals with the contract theory of government. That is, government is a contract between the people and the rulers, and as long as ruling is, is uh, fair, the contract exists, but government can break the contract you know, by oppression. That's a new theory. I mean, that, doesn't, that does, didn't exist under a monarchy. There's no contract between a monarch and the people. He just does what he wants. I mean, you can't break anything. You're stuck with him for as long as the, the royal line goes on. You know, in England, it's still going on. It started in 1066, so it goes forever. Um, in part two of the work, he attacked, he attacked specifically hereditary monarchy and hereditary aristocracy. He uh, even went as far as to say that it was um, illegal. I mean, he said at one point, what, what right does a, a, a bastard from France have to march into England and simply take the country without the permission of the people and set himself as a, uh, up as a monarch and become the first British monarch from which now um, 1,700 years of monarchs are descended. The whole thing is illegal from the start. And you can imagine how this was read in England. <laughs> Part three uh, is where the anthology excerpt comes from. This is the, the ringing call for independence, a, flea, a plea really for America to become an asylum for the beleaguered people of Europe. Now, after this work, and after the, the Declaration of Independence, we'll, which we'll look at shortly, Payne um, joined the military and fought then from late in 1776 all the way through until 1783. And, uh, during that time, in the heat of battle, often immediately after a battle, he would write a, a paper. And these were gathered, are gathered under the title of the American Crisis. Sixteen of them all together, uh, written on the battlefield between 1776 and the end of the war, 1783. So over eight years. And uh, the, uh, the, the opening paragraph of the first one is, is famous, the line is famous. Um, these are t the times that try men's souls. Keep in mind, they're right in a battle. This was written to inspire the soldiers who were you know, recovering, smarting from their wounds, resting up the day after a battle. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. Uh, and there, these, are, these are gathered. They make up a substantial book if you put these together. They, they run most of them anywhere from five to, oh, as many as 15 pages in length. Uh, I mean, he really were written in the heat of the, the battle. One, one of them was written, um, the only thing he had to write on was the head of a drum. And, and he wrote this whole thing out on the head of a drum. They carried the drum over and read it to the soldiers. Uh, eight years later, he penned the, the last of these. It, it says number 13. There were really 16 of them. There are three in between that were not numbered, so the total is 16. Uh, this is not in the anthology, but he uses his opening phrase from the first one, which, remember, these are the times that try men's souls. That became a famous phrase. He became famous for that. And here in the last one, at the end of the war, everything has is settled now. Britain has been defeated finally after eight years. He says, the times that try men's souls are over and the greatest and completest revolution the world ever knew gloriously and happily accomplished. To see it in our power to make a world happy, to exhibit on the theater of the universe a character hitherto unknown, a new creation entrusted to our hands, are honors that command reflection and can neither be too highly estimated nor too gratefully received. And uh, he, Payne almost started the sort of mytholo mythological hoopla 
that is associated with the American Revolution. Here, for instance, is what he goes on to say in this same paper. It is not every country, perhaps there is not another in the world, that can boast so fair an origin. Even the first settlement of America corresponds with the character of the Revolution. And ne America needs never be ashamed to tell her birth, nor relate the stages by which she rose to empire. Uh, the first settlement of America, of course, he's talking about Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth as refuges, refu uh, refuges really from the tyranny of Europe, and he sees America still fulfilling that function. And uh, here is his final, uh, final statement about himself and sort of signing off from the American Revolution. Now he will move on. He says, it was the cause of America that made me an author. The force with which it struck my mind made it impossible for me to be silent. I therefore take my leave of the subject. I have most sincerely followed it from the beginning to end and through all its turns and windings. And whatever country I may hereafter be in, I shall always feel an honest pride at the part I have taken and acted and a gratitude to nature and providence for putting it in my power to be of some use to mankind. And he signed himself, symbolically, common sense, at the end of his last American Crisis paper. And it, it's very fitting that he would, he would leave it that way, whatever country I'm in, because that's the way he was. I mean, he came to America in 1774, at the end of the year, and 13 months later, he's written the most important pamphlet ever written in American history, a Britisher. He went back to England then. He spent a lot of time building an iron bridge. Um, he was a kind of mechanic in interest. And then, of course, you see in the 1780s, France is in a turmoil. French Revolution is 1789, so Paine is off to France, and that's where he wrote The, the, the Rights of Man. So. He, he was in the thick of revolution wherever it was. Uh, if, I mean, if, if he had lasted, you know, he'd, he'd have been in the Russian Revolution writing pamphlets for them in 1917. Uh, he was just that sort of, just that sort of a man. Really quite remarkable. But I think even more remarkable is this man, Thomas Jefferson closest thing in America to a truly Renaissance man. <clears throat> the Second Continental Congress was going on in the spring of 1776. And on June 2nd of 1776, Richard Henry Lee proposed a resolution of independence for England. And a committee was set up, this man, Thomas Jefferson was a, one of a committee of five. The others were Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania, uh, John Adams from Massachusetts, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, and Robert Livingston from New York. And of course, Jefferson himself came from Virginia, and so you have representatives from five colonies, but you actually have representatives from both North, Middle, and Southern colonies. And of course, this is taking place in a middle colony in Philadelphia. This was a committee to draft a declaration. Uh, this, this committee was formed on June 6th, and uh, four days after Richard, Lee, uh, Richard Henry Lee had proposed a resolution of independence, this committee of five was formed to draft uh, a declaration. They gave the task over to Thomas Jefferson, who was 33 years of age, and he was probably the best writer of anybody at the, at the convention. The reason he got the job was most likely because two years earlier he had written a work called A Summary View of the Rights of British America, and this had impressed so many intellectuals in America that, that uh, Thomas Jefferson was sort of the symbolic leader of this whole idea of, of, of the rights of humans in America. And, um, and so um, Jefferson set about to write it. 
here's, here's the original in his handwriting with cross outs and so on. Now in the Library of Congress. Your anthology um, is, is interesting because it includes the, the final draft that Jefferson presented and then in italics and bracketed it shows what the members of the committee and other members of the Congress crossed out and it shows words in bold caps that were added. So you can actually see the editing process and what is uh, very remarkable is uh, how much of Jefferson remained. The, the words added are very minimal. The thing was edited down and particularly in the, in the middle part there's a long, couple long paragraphs that were just cut out entirely as not necessary. But uh, essentially the declaration that we have today is, is his work. In contrast with Thomas Paine, uh, Paine is forceful and fiery, even strident in common sense, whereas Thomas Jefferson uh, is, uh, oh, he's not austere, but he's, he, he really stands back with a kind of grandeur in his, in his view. He puts everything very calmly and precisely. And uh, some of the best writing you'll find we're done in America is right here. Uh, he, Jefferson seems to have recognized that he was speaking to an entire world. Paine seemed to be speaking just for the moment. But Jefferson has this sort of bigger sense that, that these are words, yes they address the moment, but these words will exist for all time. And uh, this was a thing unheard of. I mean, to, to us it's routine. But this was the first time, the first time ever a colony had declared independence. This was absolutely unheard of. And uh, they knew their lives were in danger. Um, someone, you know, after this was done, said, you know, we, we're going to have to hang together. Or we will hang together. Uh, so this was a very dangerous undertaking that, that they were uh, doing. The whole world of Europe would hear of this, read of it, note every word. And Jefferson thus approached his whole task with a great deal of, of thought, a kind of calm majesty in his presentation. He knew the audience was immense, the entire world of Europe and possibly unborn generations uh, down the centuries. Jefferson, as I say, was a perfect choice. He was one of the most learned men in America, and I think he still ranks as one of the learned men in American history. Absolutely, without question, he is the most learned president this country has ever had, the third president. Uh, we haven't had any that have even measured up halfway in the last century. He was a member of a prominent Virginia family. He was a graduate of William and Mary University. He was a practicing lawyer at age 24. Uh, he was a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. And at, already at age 31, he was a, an author of, of the tract on the rights of man in the colonies. He was learned in science, government, philosophy, mathematics, and medicine. Medicine, yes. One early biographer said he was a gentleman, and I'm quoting, who could calculate an eclipse, survey an estate, tie an artery, plan a building, try a cause, break a horse, dance a minuet, and play the violin. That's what I mean by a Renaissance man. And as I say, he was probably the best writer of the second Continental uh, Congress, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which impel them to the separation. 
Built into this is enlightenment thought, the laws of nature and nature's God. That's the God of deism. Uh, and the decent respect to the opinions of mankind, how different from firing off a, a, a gun as the opening of a war. This is a rational treatment. We're going to declare independence, and here is our well thought out reason, and we do it out of respect to you. And then it moves into fully enlightenment thought. There are no truths here that have been handed down from, from on high. There's nothing that that's, has its origin in heaven or in some great abstract principle. It's all self-evident. It's all right here for any person to see. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these, secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. The uh, Declaration of Independence breaks free of history in a remarkable, in a remarkable way. Uh, Europe was still saddled with the divine right of kings. God, and government in other words, is God's rule carried through by rulers. New England had been saddled with a theocracy, which was basically the same thing. Uh, uh, magistrates and church officials who were there because they were doing God's work on earth. Uh, ruled by a theological elite. America was scarcely beyond these ideas. They'd only, only begun to fold up a matter of three or four decades before this document was, was written. And one tries to imagine had independence come, I mean, had, had these men decided to write the Declaration of Independence three or four decades earlier, how saddled and convoluted it would have been with theological principles. But by this time in the century, it is fully fully enlightened. One does not need to go to a higher purpose, a, a deity, a, a set of abstract principles to, to show this. Uh, the whole idea of government instituted by God or, or, or kings is gone. Now it's all shifted over. Government is something instituted by man. It is there to serve the, the, the individual man. And here we have Jefferson, fully an enlightened man, able to articulate that in some of the clearest you notice how clear writing has suddenly become when you move to, to Benjamin Franklin, it starts there, and then you move to Paine, and when you get to Jefferson, you have, you have some of the clearest uh, writing that one can imagine. This is Jefferson's crowning achievement, and it's been said that this, this document is the greatest achievement of the liberal enlightenment. Uh, it drew on the natural rights idea rather than God-given rights. It drew on John Locke's two treatises, two treatises on government. It drew on the French philosophes, the best philosophical thought. And, um, and you see, Jefferson knew these people. He was a, he was a scholar. Uh, The uh, Declaration takes on an irresistible power because it's based on the Enlightenment idea of man as essentially good, with, of course, a power to shape his own hands, to take his own destiny in, into his own hands. It's not under, on, under dependence on God's grace or providence. And the idea that, that governments are made by man is essentially the the America, it's the American invention, and we can see it in this document uh, beginning to be invented before our eyes. Of course, it's going to be another 11 years before the Constitution takes shape, again, under the, a group of very learned men who, who sat down and studied and read every major government document that had ever been written in the Western world before they did the Constitution. What is remarkable is that, that Jefferson 
in about four days was able to come up with this. He was already at that point in his, in his thinking and, and that well educated him. He didn't have time to run off to a library and do research. You know, he just came out with this. He was ready for it. Um, this also assumes what's been called a mechanical theory of, of um, institutions, which is that institutions are something that we construct, that human beings construct according to what they want. They put them together piece by piece the way they want them to be. And uh, this was a new idea. Up until now, institutions had, been, had evolved quite, quite by accident, by history, by struggle, by warfare, by revolution. Uh, hardly planned. I mean, when you take the governments, most of the governments of Europe at this time, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of an accumulation of centuries with this added and this added and this gets old and it's thrown out and something else added. But there's no overall plan. The interesting thing about, about the American government is that it was written sort of with a plan. Um, the American Declaration of Independence has a three-part structure. The first part has two paragraphs, a, a uh, preamble which states the occasion. It's now become necessary to dissolve the ties. And then the long paragraph, uh, the self-evident truths paragraph, which are the premises upon which the whole thing will be based. This is a brilliant foundation. As I say, no religion, no philosophy could be offended by it. The inalienable rights gives a kind of unquestionable foundation for it. That's not based on anything else. It's simply asserted. This may be one of the great examples of argument by assertion. You say it well enough and strongly enough that nobody can argue with it. Putting in inalienable rights in was, was really not necessary to declare independence. I mean, that could all have been left out. But this is where you sense that, that Jefferson is looking down the ages here and realizing that he wants to say not only are we, do we have inalienable rights, which is causing us to break with England, but we're never going to let this happen again. These rights are permanent and eternal. We're never going to let ourselves get in a position of dominance again. So there are things in the document that, that do go beyond the specific occasion of uh, declaring independence. There is then the adjust, a justification for the declaration, and this is, this is a kind of mini history of the abuses of the English king. Again, there's, there's a rhetoric of persuasion here. Uh, Eighteen times he uses the words, he has, and uh, I think altogether there's 25 to 30 abuses that he catalogs in that long second part. And again, the, the he has done this, he has done that, the repetition becomes a kind of cumulative argument in itself. And uh, finally then, you get to the third part, which reads, we therefore do solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And uh, I mentioned this bef before. This is, this is what we call a performative use of language. This is, this is like when the minister says, I now pronounce you man and wife. The stating of the words performs the function. Um, and of course, this is, this is the power we give, we give to words for solemn occasions. Uh, religion has lots of these, politics has lots of these. When presidents are sworn in, when, uh, when you get your degree, you know, and you are now pronounced a graduate, those are performative uses of words that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And then the, the pledge at the end. The, um, there is, at the end of the second part, after he's accused the British king of all these things, there's a, there's a kind of apology. Jefferson summarizes there uh, all the efforts the colonists have made to rectify the situation all to no avail. Well, 
Jefferson uh, is really quite a remarkable man. He was an architect. He was inspired to design buildings. Here, for instance, is the Virginia Capitol building that he designed. In France, at Nimes, he saw a Roman temple from the first century. And he wrote in his, in his journals while he was traveling in Europe that he thought this particular temple was the most perfect model of ancient architecture remaining on Earth. He took the design and designed the uh, Virginia Capitol, which, which is in Richmond. And he wrote that he uh, hoped to improve the taste of his countrymen through his architecture. And uh, it's this kind of monumental architecture that, that he brought in that did have a very profound uh, effect. Uh, on later architecture. I mean, he, he, and he just didn't take a classical architecture exactly the way it was. He, he modified it. Uh, he was a very good draftsman and had a very good eye for proportion. In his old age, he designed the central architecture of the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. He called it the hobby of my old age, his last service to his country. He was 75 years old when the plans for the University of Virginia at Charlottesville were approved. And he was able to watch it from his home up on a hill just south of Charlottesville through a telescope, watch it being built. His great dream, however, from a very young age, was Monticello, the little mountain. Here is a sketch he made at age 26, 1769. All my wishes end where I hope my days will end at Monticello. It was his dream. He began building it at age 26. The same year he began a 40-year political career. 250 miles away in Philadelphia and Washington and so on. And so Monticello was, was always uh, five or six carriage days ride away. But he went on building this for, for 12 years, finished it, um, took his new bride there. After 10 years, he became dissatisfied with the design uh, and rebuilt it. It is truly a magnificent piece of work and uh, a European visitor said that Mr. Jefferson is the first American who has consulted the fine arts to know how he should shelter himself. And uh, late in his life he said, my farm, my family, my books, and my building give me more pleasure than any public office. He attached an odometer to the wheel of his carriage, then multiplied out the circumference after he had traveled from Philadelphia to Monticello and calculated that it was 269 miles between the two. On today's highways, it's about 250 miles. In 1803, he uh, made probably the largest land purchase in history, the Louisiana Purchase, purchased from France, stretched all the way to the Canadian border here, all the way to New Orleans here, from St. Louis out to Santa Fe. Nearly one million, actually 909 million, 900, I'm sorry, 909,000 square miles. Bought it for $15,000. The next year, he set out the Lewis and Clark expedition to explore western, the western United States. And uh, they uh, kept journals, elaborate journals. 
And that's where, incidentally, the second most important Native American woman comes into history, Sacagawea, who guided them. Um, if you want to read a popular book, uh, you put that on the screen so that you can just see it. Sacagawea by Anna Lee Waldo. This came out in 1978, sold over a million copies. This is a popular book, but it's the only popular book I know of that has a 35-page bibliography in the back. Anna Lee Waldo spent many years writing this book. It's also one of the biggest novels you can find. I think this, this, this book tops, tops out at um, 1,345 pages, so this is this little, it's almost as much as the whole course in the anthology to read. But Sacagawea guided the Lewis and Clark expedition, um, and, and thus, as I say, probably after Pocahontas became the second most well-known uh, Native American woman. Uh, architecture was his love. He designed an octagon. There's the ground floor plan. 80 miles further southwest of Monticello, he called it Poplar Forest. Here is a front elevation of that particular uh, structure with porches around and, and, and so on. Um, now, I, I've been in this. It's not fully restored yet. It's, they're in the process of restoring it. You know, funds for these sorts of things are difficult, but, but there's a, a photograph of it. And so while he lived in Monticello, about four times a year he would go the additional 80 miles southwest and, and stay at um, Poplar, Poplar Forest. Um, what's added to American literature by these, uh, by these uh, men is, is a command of persuasive rhetoric. I might comment that if you've noticed the change in the, in the English um, that's happened between the 17th century, usually we, we think of the 17th century as the late Renaissance, and modern English is usually dated from 1700. And so when you move from, from people like Cotton Mather and Ann Rowlandson across that 1700 borderline into people like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine, you are into modern English. And uh, thus the, the language is, you don't have uh, different spellings and uh, the odd different spelling, but a grammar and syntax and the whole manner of argument becomes distinctly modern at that, at that uh, point. Uh, just to put this on a map to, um, to get the connections, uh, here is Washington and, and the Potomac River here in Chesapeake Bay. And down here is Charlottesville where the University of Virginia is. And you see Monticello, Little Mountain, uh, just three miles out. And this is where he could sit and, and see the building of of uh, the University of Virginia, and then down here, 80 miles further down, you have Pop Poplar Forest. These are places, you know, worth worth seeing if you're in that part of the country. Very well, worth seeing. Now, in searching around for some way to demonstrate how influential the Declaration of Independence has been. I wanted to look for a dramatic example, something that's not in your history book, something that most people don't know. So here it is. In 1941, uh, Roosevelt met with Churchill in a boat. This is in the middle of World War II, in a boat off the coast of Newfoundland, and they framed the Atlantic Charter. And they committed themselves to decolonizing the world after the war. For the United States, that just meant giving up the Philippines. For England, they had 35 colonies or so, but Churchill signed. Now, you would think that having signed that, the United States would be committed to assisting in a decolonization process. Well, not many people, well, maybe some of you will recognize this man. That's Ho Chi Minh. That's the man that 
we fought against in America's longest war, 1964 to 1973. He was the leader of the North Vietnamese. Let me tell you just a little bit about Ho Chi Minh. Born in 1890, as a young man, he worked in England. He worked in Harlem. He swept straits in Harlem. And he worked all his life for the independence of Vietnam. Vietnam was under colonial rule by France. And Ho Chi Minh wanted independence from France. In 1919, he happened to be in Paris when President Woodrow Wilson was there stumping for the League of Nations proposal and his famous 14 points. And since Woodrow Wilson was, was talking very vociferously about colonization and giving freedom to people that were under oppression, Ho Chi Minh thought, you know, I should ask him for some assistance for Vietnam. We have been under French rule for, for decades. And so he wrote a note to President Wilson in Paris, 1919, and got no reply. Thirty years later, he wrote a similar note to President Truman in 1949. He got no reply. But to give you some idea of how profoundly influenced this man was, was by the idea of America, this is the man, keep in mind, that Americans fought for nine years in Vietnam. This man idealized America. The Japanese took Vietnam and all of the Southeast Asian countries away from the colonial powers when they invaded. When the Japanese were defeated, the colonial European countries expected to walk right back in. France expected to walk into Vietnam, the Dutch expected to walk into Indonesia, the British expected to walk into Mal the Malay Peninsula and so on. Ho Chi Minh thought, why should they? And so on September the 2nd of 1945, Ho Chi Minh invited a couple of Americans to, to be present. This is virtually the day after, or, or within a few days after the Japanese had surrendered. And he invited a few Americans to be present while he read the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. And here's the way it reads. We hold truth that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet during and throughout the last 80 years, the French imperialists have denied us our every freedom. It was ignored when he asked Woodrow Wilson in 1919. It was ignored for help uh, when he asked President Truman four years after that for assistance in 1949, and not getting the assistance to do what uh, the Americans had said they were really for in the Atlantic Charter, Ho Chi Minh did the only thing he could. He turned to where he could get help. He turned to the communists. And he used communist power to beat the French out in the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954. And we ended up, he ended up fighting against the Americans because essentially Americans wouldn't help him. This was, a, this was a war of independence. And it's too bad that with the ideals that had been espoused by America that we somehow got on the wrong side instead of being there to help man do. And you know, when you look at this, uh, this Declaration of Independence, here's his actual declaration at the end. For these reasons, we solemnly declare, and these reasons, he's outlined those in a middle section almost parallel to what Jefferson did in 1776. For these reasons, we solemnly declare to the world, Vietnam, right, Vietnam has the right to be free and independent, and in fact has become free and independent. The people of Vietnam decide to mobilize all their spiritual and material forces and to sacrifice their lives and property in order to safeguard their right of liberty and independence. Somehow we got on the wrong side of that war of independence and didn't support it the right way. And so fought for nine years and ended up anyway pulling out. And they didn't get their independence. 
and 55,000 Americans died in the process. Well, history has some strange things. That's one of the strangest influences of the American Declaration. Uh, it's not well known, but you can find it in any good history of Vietnam. Well, have a good day.